Pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We are in the midst of a sermon series about the many characters in the Bible who are important to the story, but who do not get a name in scripture. The Samaritan woman at the well is one of these anonymous folks, but the name tradition gives her is well known to those of you who have been watching The Chosen, and long before the TV series, the Eastern Orthodox Church gave her the name Saint Photini, from the Greek root phos, meaning light. She is known as the enlightened one, the illuminator. By the radiance of her witness, we are able to see that Christ's gift of salvific love and abundant life, abundant life, which is life in the presence of God now and forever from now, is available to all. So because today's scripture is a long and wonderful dialogue, I will intersperse commentary into this paraphrase. If you would like to follow along, we are in the Gospel according to John, chapter 4, verses 5 through 42. Having upset the religious leaders in Judea, Jesus decides to take the short route back to Galilee. There's just one problem, he's going through Samaria. Tensions between Samaritans and Judeans have a date back for centuries. They share scripture, but they worship at different holy sites. To make matters worse, the Judeans destroyed the Samaritan's holy shrine just 150 years before Jesus shows up unexpectedly to talk to a local woman. Nevertheless, Jesus and his disciples take off on this short road trip through Samaria, and at noon they stop for lunch. The disciples go looking for some first century fast food, and Jesus sits down to rest. He happens to sit down at one of the most popular proposal spots in all of Hebrew scripture, Jacob's Well. It's the Buckingham Fountain of engagement sites. So along comes a local woman to fetch some water, and we aren't told why she's doing this in the middle of the day, though people like to assume it's because she's shunned. Or maybe she simply needs some water. In any case, she's probably hot, tired, and in no mood to talk to a peasant whose best opening line is, give me a drink. She snaps back. How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jesus answers, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that was asking, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman is no fool. She knows her scripture, and she's certainly smart enough to know that if you come to the well, you bring your own hydro flask. So she says, sir, you have no bucket. The well is deep. Where do you get this living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? Jesus continues with his metaphorical proposal. Everyone who drinks of this water will not be thirsty again, but those who drink my water will never be thirsty. The water that I give will become in them a spring of gushing up to eternal life. So amused, the woman decides to see what will happen if she accepts. Sir, give me this water so that I will never be thirsty again and I won't have to keep coming here to get water. And Jesus shifts the conversation abruptly. Go get your husband. I have no husband, she says. But Jesus already knows this. He's never met her face to face, but he knows her innermost thoughts like only the divine can know them. He tells her, you have had five husbands, and the one you are with now is not your husband. Now notice, Jesus says this pretty matter-of-factly without condemnation. The text doesn't tell us whether it was divorce or death or some other cruel twist of fate that has left her in this predicament. But the setting gives us important clues about Jesus' intentions. He's not only offering a different kind of water, he's offering a different kind of lasting relationship than the ones she has known. 
All right, she thinks. He must be a prophet, so she decides to give him a bit of a theological test, pointing southward to the rubble of her holy shrine. She says, our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say the place where people must worship is Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. The hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Again, she responds with what she knows from Scripture. I know that the Messiah is coming, the one they call Christ. And for the first time in John's gospel, Jesus identifies himself directly using the very same words that God identified God's self with at the burning bush to Moses. I am, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. So just then the disciples come back and the woman abandons her water jar to go to the village saying, come and see this man who has told me everything I have ever done. She tempts the villagers with a question. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? And so it goes, many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. They came to stay with Jesus and they said to the woman, we have heard for ourselves and we know that this is truly the savior of the world. Thanks be to God for God's holy word. So there are at least three strikes against Fotini. She's a Samaritan, she's a woman, and she's a quintuple divorcee, which is one of the more polite ways that her moral character has been described throughout the centuries. Other sympathetic commentators cast her as a victim, a powerless woman in an entrenched patriarchy. But maybe there's another way to interpret this text, one which recognizes the role that she plays in illuminating the full arc of the gospel, where Jesus reaches across the vast chasm of unbelief, separating humans from God. Jesus doesn't offer Fotini abundant life in spite of who she is or what she's done. He offers it to her because of who she is. A Samaritan, a woman, imperfect, ordinary, and human. By my count, there are a few things more important about the Samaritan woman than the number of husbands she's had. In fact, she's a record holder in John's Gospel. She holds the record for one of the longest theological discussions with Jesus. She's the first person to whom Jesus directly reveals himself, and she's the first to go and tell, Jesus, tell others who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. This is why Byzantine chants sing of her as Fotini, equal to the apostles. Other characters in this gospel, even though from Jesus, those from Jesus' own tradition, are too dim-witted to understand his complex metaphors. In the glare of the noonday sun, it is Fotini who sees that Jesus offers something more essential than water in the desert, an everlasting relationship with God that brings joy, purpose, and meaning to an ordinary life. Aren't we all muddling our way through the mundane? We put dinner on the table and laundry in the washing machine. We make the coffee so we can manage the commute. We wait in the carpool lane and we wait for the grade to post. We call the plumber and we call our mothers, sometimes even in the right order. We log into Zoom again. It's fine, we say everything's fine, but deep down, the well of joy feels a little bit dry. Is this all that life has to offer? The lucky among us know a beloved, a BFF, or a brother who's, in whose presence our hearts overflow. With them, even washing the dishes can be fun. Even a road trip across the nothingness of Nebraska can bring joy and laughter. With them, we dare to hope, as poet Mary Oliver hopes, to be a bride married to amazement, to be a bridegroom taking the world into my arms, to never wonder if I have made of something of my life that is particular and real. Almost exactly three years ago, the world shut down, and I made a habit of walking the familiar trail from my house through Middle Fork, Savannah. Like all of us, I was worried about what would happen. What did it mean to stay away from everyone? What did it 
Where was God in the fear and uncertainty? These are the things that I was wondering as I got to the bridge. And there I understood this metaphor in a new way. I saw the tiny flowing stream, the middle fork, which eventually joins two others to become the Chicago River. I saw that even when I am forced to stand still and be separated from the people and places I love, God's grace is always moving toward us through the savannah and through Samaria. So in Protestant tradition, she is known by the gender and ethnic identity of her quasi-title, the Samaritan woman. And it's her namelessness that reminds us that she could be you or me or our best friend. She absolutely could be our worst enemy. Living water is for all. The Samaritan woman in John is a theologian, versed in scripture and able to hold her own with Jesus himself. This is a great text for the Sunday after International Women's Day because it gives me an opportunity to tell you about another woman theologian, Georgia Harkness, the first woman theologian to teach at a United States seminary, and she did so just down the road at my alma mater, Garrett, from 1939 to 1950. She was an advocate for women's ordination, and she once held her own against one of Christianity's greatest thinkers, Karl Barth. She was at the World Council of Churches gathering, a gathering commemorated in our narthex stained glass window. Bart and a couple men walked into a session on the life and work of women in the church. And so the chairman called on Georgia Harkness to defend women's ordination. She knew her Bible and maybe thinking of the Samaritan woman, she said this, in the New Testament, Jesus always assumed that men and women were equal before God. Bart thought this was completely wrong and argued that way. The room began to buzz, and Harkness later said, Bart convinced nobody, and if it was a joke, it backfired. A year later, when asked if he remembered meeting this woman theologian, he said, remember me not of that woman. Today, Garrett grads wear red shoes to ordination and graduation in her honor. And if you want to know why, come and find me during coffee hour and I will share that story with you. So as someone who was ordained in red shoes and stands here in this pulpit today, it is easy to think that the question of women's ordination has been settled, at least in mainline Protestantism, it has. But just a few weeks ago, the Southern Baptist Convention ousted Saddleback Church after they ordained several women who were longtime, decades-long staffers. This is the same Saddleback Church founded by Rick Warren, who wrote the bestseller, The Purpose Driven Life the same Saddleback Church where 20,000 people worship each week. Religious division and controversy is not new. In today's text, we see the animosity between the Judeans and the Samaritans. Decades later, when the Gospel according to John is written, people are being kicked out of the synagogues. The Eastern Orthodox Church, who celebrates the Feast of St. Fotini this time of year, was excommunicated by the Roman Catholics in the Great Schism of 1054 because they couldn't agree on whether or not to use unleavened bread for communion and the wording of the Nicene Creed. So not only is this a particularly good text for Women's Month, it is also a really great text for Kenilworth Union Church. You may recall that in the founding constitution, they wrote, recognizing the minor differences which exist among believers, we have united as a church of Jesus Christ upon the great essentials of the Christian faith. And for all of our 130 year history, unity across our differences has been a guiding principle. At the same time, Protestant Christianity in the United States was breaking into what historian David Hollinger calls two broad categories, the ecumenical and the evangelical. And if you are curious, like me, how a church like this one exists in a rapidly fracturing religious landscape, you will find Hollinger's book a very provocative read. Kenilworth Union remains fiercely independent, but I think Hollinger would place us more in the ecumenical than the evangelical camp for a few reasons. Our participation in the World Council of Churches movement, the way we read and interpret the Bible seriously, but not literally, 
and the fact that senior ministers come from mainline Protestant traditions. And yes, women preach and pastor here. I've been working on a paper for my doctoral program in which I claim that unity is as close to doctrine as you might find at Kenilworth Union Church. This founding principle is threaded throughout our worship and our ministry. Deep in the archives, I was delighted to find an, a document called The Inclusive Jesus, which credits Dr. Bowen and Susie Kiphart with articulating how to use this kind of theology with children. Listen to their wisdom for a divided world. God wants us to live in community, and our community has become worldwide. If we want a peaceful world, we cannot afford to negatively judge other cultures and faiths just because they are different. We cannot afford to proclaim that some will go to heaven and some will not. This is God's domain. We want to teach our children about the inclusive Jesus so they can offer love and forgiveness in the world and find joy in doing so. Kenilworth Union's two guiding scriptures are carved in stone, literally. Uh, but if we were to ever consider a third, I'm going to nominate today's text about the Samaritan woman, the quintuple divorcee whose story shows that Jesus will never be hemmed in by human borders, boundaries, prejudices, or stereotypes. Friends, people are weary of wandering around the deserts of division all long to be invited out of our mundane existence into God's presence where we are truly seen and deeply known. We yearn to come and see Jesus' never-ending stream of love and welcome because Jesus is the living water in the driest places and the relationship that lasts. So hearing this good news, may we be like Fotini, so changed by God Christ's inclusive grace that we shine with joy as bright as the noonday sun.